people often get very, very confused about the differences between a lot of these uh, acronyms which are thrown around in the context of hematology. So microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, DIC, HUS, all of these things can seem to get mixed in and amongst themselves. And it's easy enough to rote learn them and try and associate one with being a triad or one with a pentad or something else. However, I think it's actually much easier once you actually have some understanding of what's going on within the blood vessels. It really helps you understand why these manifestations come about. So I'm firstly going to talk about microangiopathic hemolytic anemia or MAHA. So the trick is in the name. So it's microangiopathic, meaning that it affects small vessels. Hemolytic, meaning that there are red cells being broken down. And of course, it causes anemia as a consequence of the red cells being broken down. So essentially, it's actually not giving you a huge amount of information. It's just telling you that red cells are being broken within small vessels. And normally that tends to be due to the formation of some sort of platelet plug, which means that the red cells are no longer able to go through the small vessels unscathed, and they actually end up being shredded into small fragments of red cells. So the key point I'm trying to make here is that microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is just a description of a mechanism of red cell breakdown. It's not a disease in itself, and it certainly isn't a diagnosis. It just means that the red cells are being broken down in small vessels. Now let's move on to talk about hemolytic uremic syndrome. So again, if we look at the name, hemolytic means Maha specifically. Uremic suggests that there's renal failure. And the bit that makes it a syndrome altogether is that it also causes thrombocytopenia. So why does hemolytic uremic syndrome happen? So just to set the scene, the blood vessels we're talking about in hemolytic uremic syndrome are the small vessels within the kidneys, the glomerular vessels. So it is a syndrome that is usually associated with a specific type of E. coli. So it's E. coli 0157H7. And it is a very specific type of E. coli because it produces something called sugar-like toxin. And the problem with sugar-like toxin is that it can cause endothelial injury, especially within the glomerular vessels. So once it causes glomerular injury, we get a platelet plug forming. We then get red cells being unable to pass through this narrowing within the glomerular vessels, and hence we get destruction of these red cells. So just to go through that one by one again, there's platelet consumption, which is why we get thrombocytopenia. There is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia because these red cells are being broken down within small vessels. And finally, given that these blood cells are unable to get through this narrowing in a uh, complete form and provide decent perfusion to the end organs, it results in this case in renal failure because the glomerular vessels are unable to actually pass healthy red blood cells through them to perfuse the kidney. So this is why in HUS we get the triad of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, renal failure and thrombocytopenia. So just to go back to the clinical picture again, it's caused by a specific type of E. coli which causes diarrhea. So a lot of the time it presents in children with all of the manifestations seen on screen right now and they are likely to have had some sort of history of diarrhea preceding the development of the renal impairment, thrombocytopenia and maha. So moving on to thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So the thrombotic part suggests that there's clots forming. Thrombocytopenic suggests that there's low platelets and purpura suggests that there's some sort of purpuric rash around. So why does this happen? So remember we previously mentioned the von Willebrand factor multimers, which are quite sticky and can attach themselves onto the endothelium even when it's not damaged and cause a platelet plug to form. So normally we would have ADAMTS13 breaking down the multimers into monomers. However, in TTP, we get antibodies generated against ADAMTS13, which prevents it from carrying out its role in breaking down these multimers into monomers. So there's a reduction in ADAMTS13, and that can be due to a number of causes. Quite often it's unknown, but it can also be associated with other conditions such as cancer and pregnancy. So what we end up with is that there's lots and lots of multimers floating around, and then eventually one of these will stick onto the endothelium, cause the formation of a platelet plug, and hence this results in platelet consumption and thrombocytopenia. And just as in HUS, it means that red cells aren't going to get through very easily, and they're going to shear the red cells and reduce end organ perfusion, 
So the key difference here between TTP and HUS is that HUS only affects the glomerular vessels, and hence a reduction in end organ perfusion leads to renal impairment. In TTP, it can happen basically anywhere. So if a reduction in end organ perfusion affects the brain specifically, it can result in confusion. So this is why one of the defining features of TTP is some sort of change in brain function. And finally, DIC. So disseminators suggest that it's all over the body. Intravascular means that it's within the blood vessels. And coagulation means that it's something to do with clotting. So remember that we have tissue factor, which is uh, present in the tissues just outside our blood vessels. So DIC is primarily caused by something that leads to an increase in our exposure to tissue factor. So causes include sepsis, tumors, or pancreatitis. So something that leads to there being more tissue factor within our circulation. So what happens in this case is that all of our factor 7 gets rapidly activated to factor 7a and this triggers a coagulation cascade that results in the formation of lots of little clots all over our body with uh, fibrin being formed as well. So essentially once this process has kicked off it leads to an increase in platelet consumption and hence the total platelet count goes down and also it leads to an increase in coagulation factor cons consumption. So all of our coagulation factors go down and we become massively at increased risk of bleeding. So this is something that I used to find a little bit difficult to really understand because in my head I always thought that anticoagulant factors and procoagulant factors exist in a sort of balance. So I thought okay if you're using up all your anticoagulant factors and your procoagulant factors then would you not expect the blood to be fairly normal at the end of it. However in reality it's actually a bit more like this. So clotting is an active process meaning that the balance actually looks a bit more like this. So the anticoagulants are quite good at trying to balance things off. However, on the whole, if you remove both of these components, the balance will shift towards no clotting happening whatsoever. So anticoagulants only make sense if coagulation is actually going on, whereas in this case, if all the factors are spent, it means that the blood will not clot at all, and hence patients can have really, really bad bleeding.